Hey everyone, welcome to week three of Econometrics. This week we move into multiple regression. And multiple regression is a really key extension to what we've been doing because it introduces additional variables into the regression equation and allows us to get into some more sophisticated statistical model building. So I think you'll find it interesting and uh, you're already uh, well on the way to understanding the basic concept. So we're just gonna build on what you already know. Now you have a quiz coming up. so. Um, make sure you're keeping up with the readings. I do expect you to have worked through the first few sections of the R manual. Let's see where you're supposed to be. Um, by the end of this week, you should have finished uh, section 6.1 to 6.4 of the R tutorial. So you wanna have made good progress through that. And if you are running into trouble, be sure you let me know or let one of the TAs know and we'll be glad to help you. Uh, also with the quiz that's coming up, do the practice quiz. The practice quiz is very important. It doesn't count for anything. It's not very hard. Uh, hopefully you'll find the questions pretty easy, but uh, it allows you to run through the whole procedure online so that you make sure you understand how to do an online test with the uh, course link system. So uh, we're all set, grab your pens and let's get started. So we are starting the topic of multiple regression. And multiple just means we're going to start including more explanatory variables in a model. So let's, let's develop a new example that we'll stick with all the way through this topic. So let's say that we want to explain house prices. Okay, so you can suppose, for instance, that you work for a house builder, a house building company I bought a big chunk of land, you know, laying out the plans for the different houses, and uh, it's your job to make recommendations on the pricing. And uh, so what you want to know is if the, uh, if the group on the building side, if they go to the expense of adding an extra bathroom to the house, how much does that add to the value of the house? How much more can you charge for the house? So um, to answer a question like that, uh, we're interested in this case, not simply how much does it cost to add the bathroom, but how much more can you sell it for? So um, let's say that we get data on the price of houses that are sold in this area. So we get the um, selling price of houses. And we want to explain that. And so we're going to get a bunch of explanatory variables. Now, the explanatory variables that the textbook refers to are um, the lot size in square feet, the number of bathrooms, the number of bedrooms, and the number of stories, as in how many floors in the house, and um, uh, number of stories excluding the basement. Um, and this is based on a data set that uh, is available with the textbook. Um, it's actually property prices in the city of Windsor, Ontario. They, uh, they collected, they collected, let's see, 546 houses sold in Windsor, Ontario, and they had selling price and a whole bunch of other variables besides these ones. But um, for now, we'll just include these ones. So um, we're going to construct a model, and the model is just going to be a linear equation that says uh, the selling price of a house is equal to some constant plus, now we're going to uh, need some variable names. So um, 
to make sure I follow the notation. Let's see, bedrooms is x2, bathrooms x3, number of stories x4. Okay, so then we have alpha plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 plus beta 4 x4 plus an error term. And uh, now you can see I'm going to add the little i on each of these. And one of the things uh, with multiple regression is you do need to pay attention to these little subscripts, the notation here that we use on the subscript. And so in the textbook, um, you'll see here we are, section 2.3.1. You'll notice each of these variables has uh, the subscript 1, meaning it's x1, and the subscript i, meaning, I don't know if you can see that from where you're sitting. There, let's bring it in a little bit closer. Um, the subscript i, which uh, means the observation i. Observation i on variable x1. Okay, now um, this is a, a simple linear model. And so the way this model works is if you give me data on um, all these house sales, I will use a regression method to estimate the values of the alphas and the betas. So we're going to estimate the coefficients. And then we can use that to predict what the selling price would be. So then you can go to the um, builders and say, OK, well, if you have a lot size uh, that's this size, and you're going to put up a house that has this many bedrooms, this many bathrooms, this many stories, on average, that type of house would have sold for PI hat. That's our prediction of what that house would have sold for. So um, that's the pricing recommendation. Um, why these variables? Well, these are what were available. We're going to talk about the whole decision, though, of should you include all of these? Or should you include more than these? If you have more variables, when would you decide to put more in? And when should you leave some out? But for now, let's just say this is the model that we are going to work with. Um, so all we've done, so we had something like that previously. That was our simple regression model, um, that plus the residual, but with the error term. Now we've added in the other variables. That's all we've done. So that's, that's multiple regression. Um, and now we have the error term and um, the error term is uh, this one at the end so if we want to isolate it we just take these over to the other side of the equal sign so we're subtracting them so we have p minus alpha minus beta 1 x1 minus beta 2 x2 minus beta 3 x3 3 minus beta 4 x4 four. and um, so that's the error term and in terms of the regression model when we pick coefficient values those are going to be the residuals all right so then as before we can take the sum of the squared residuals now because um, we're talking about residuals. I'm going to put the hat over top. That's the, uh, the sum of the squared residuals. So that is the sum of y minus alpha hat minus beta 1 hat x1 minus beta 2 hat x2 minus beta 3 hat x3 minus beta 4 hat x4. Okay, so for a given set of coefficient values, that means I put the hat on them because we've, we've assigned values to them. So for a given set of coefficient values, that gives us an estimated residual. And now what we want to do is pick these values, alpha hat, beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat, beta 3 hat, 
and beta 4 hat to minimize the sum of the squared residuals. And by the way, you might be wondering, why do we use the sum of the squared residuals? Why not a different measure? Why not the sum of the absolute value of the residuals? Well, you could do that, or you could use the sum of the cubed residuals, or the uh, sum of the, well, you couldn't use the log of residuals because some of them are positive and some of them are negative, but raise it to any power you like. So why the sum of the squared residuals? Um, the reason for that is that we live in a Pythagorean world where, um, uh, you know, the Pythagorean theorem is that uh, um, a squared equals b squared plus c squared. And what we're going to do in a regression model is um, we are um, decomposing the variance of the dependent variable into two parts, the explained part and the unexplained part. And the unexplained part uh, will be a squared term, and the explained part will be a squared term, and then we want to minimize the unexplained part. And that allows us to maximize the explained part. So um, that is why um, taking the square of the residuals and adding them up gives us an answer that we can interpret. And um, if you go on to uh, advanced econometrics courses, then uh, we talk a little bit more about the geometric interpretation of a regression model and why it is that uh, minimizing the sum of the squared residuals makes sense. But the idea is um, when we had that expression, the total sum of squares equals the sum of the squared residuals plus the regression sum of the squares. So that's the unexplained part and the explained part. And we, we want to do this breakdown in such a way that we minimize the size of this part. And when we do that, that means we maximize the share of the explained part. All right, that is, uh, um, that's one of the reasons that we'll use um, some of the squared residuals, minimize the sum of the squared residuals. There'll be another reason that we will get to when we talk about maximum likelihood. So just leave that aside for a moment. Um, now, if I go back to this here, so minimize the sum of squared residuals, that's a calculus problem. And we will look at the formulas for the case where there are only two variables. We won't look at it right now, but we will look at the formulas if there are two variables. But the formulas get really complicated really quickly and it's very hard to write them out for three and four variables if we're trying to do it in this algebraic notation. Right at the end of the course we'll switch to doing this in matrix notation and um, matrix notation makes it so much easier. Bit of work to learn the matrix notation but suddenly all the equations are very simple and straightforward and we can do multiple regression just as easily as simple regression. Okay so um, the statistical output. What do we get? Well, we get, as before, we get r squared, and that measures the explanatory power of the whole model. All right, and by the whole model, I mean all the variables on the right hand side. Um, so the explanatory power of the whole model is r squared. Um, we get coefficient estimates and their standard errors. So the same as before, coefficient estimates and the standard errors, and then we can use the standard errors uh, to construct 95% confidence intervals. And t-statistics. And it's exactly the same as before. t-statistics is just coefficient estimate divided by its standard error. Um, and 
then we um, what we need to do now is oh one other thing I forgot to mention we also get the F statistic so the F statistic measures probability of getting um, r squared at least this large if all the coefficients equal zero, all right? All the slope coefficients equal zero. So theta one equals theta two equals theta three equals theta four, and they all equal zero. So this, the t-statistic will let us check if any one of these uh, equals zero. The f-statistic measures the probability of getting an r squared that big if all those coefficients were equal to zero. So the f-statistic is um, looking at the explanatory power of the entire model. The t-statistics tell us something about the explanatory power of that particular variable that's in the model. Okay, and what we need to do now is uh, go over the output from multivariate regression and figure out how to interpret what we have. So at this point, just recapping, multivariate regression, uh, it's the concepts all just carry over from the simple regression case. So we've got coefficient estimates, and we've got confidence intervals, t-statistics, and an f-statistic, and r-squared. Um, when you have multiple variables, though, so we have, in this case, price equals a function of um, four explanatory variables. And just to save time with all the scribbling here, I'm just going to include two of them for now. All right. So I'm just going to include two of them. Um, and let's say um, that this is... Um, floor space. I know that wasn't one of the variables that the textbook uses, but it would be a good one to include. Floor space, and this is number of bathrooms. Okay, so this time let's say we've only got these two variables. So what exactly does beta 1 measure, and what does beta 2 measure? Um, beta 1 hat estimates the marginal effect of x1 on price holding x oh made a mistake x that should be x2 you probably spotted that already and you're waving at me but i couldn't hear you so holding x2 constant. So beta 1 hat measures the marginal effect of x1 on the price holding x2 constant. Or an another way of seeing this is um, just use some calculus. So if we take the partial derivative of the price variable with respect to x1, well that's beta 1. Okay, just differentiating a linear equation, everything else drops out, and you got beta 1 there by itself. Okay, so um, there's a few ways we can describe this. One is it's uh, the partial effect of x1 on p, but oftentimes the way we would describe it is we'll say um, it's the effect of floor space on the selling price controlling for everything else. Controlling, in this case, for the number of bathrooms, or given the number of bathrooms. So, in particular, um, what beta 1 would allow us to say is, suppose we change the design of the house, and we add more floor space, but we don't change the number of bathrooms. How will that affect the selling price? Or, alternatively, let's say the designers come back to us, and they say... Um, we're going to add another bathroom. We're just going to use some of the existing floor space to make a bathroom. We're not going to add to the floor space. We're just going to add a bathroom on its own. 
um, how would that affect the, the selling price? So beta 2 estimates the marginal effect of x2 on p holding x1 constant. And um, the um, uh, again, the the idea here is um, it allows us to break apart the information in the data set and try to isolate some of the effects here. So um, beta 2 would allow us to answer the question, uh, what happens to the price of the house if you add a bathroom but you don't add any floor space? Beta 1 allows us to say, what if you add to the floor space without changing the number of bathrooms? Um, and then, of course, if the designers come back and say, well, we're going to add to the floor space and we're going to add number of bathrooms, then you can use the two together to estimate what the effect will be on the price of the house. Now, if we go to the example in the textbook, um, so we are using, if I can zoom in here, oh, there we go. Um, we're using uh, the lot size, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, number of stories. So if you fit a model that's got these four slope coefficients, now you can get more precise about different options for pricing. What if you um, add uh, an additional bedroom, but you don't add an additional bathroom? Or what if you add two bedrooms and a bathroom and another story to the house, So, um, but you don't change the lot size? Uh, so you get the idea. This um, By doing multiple regression, we can now isolate individual effects in the data. Okay, having done that, now there's a couple of questions to ask about the choice of what variables to include in the model. Um, so let's suppose then that we, uh, we had these variables. We have observations on floor space. We have observations on the number of bathrooms. Um, but we then go ahead and we estimate the model alpha plus uh, beta 2 x 2i plus epsilon. So what if we estimated the model just with the number of bathrooms in it? Um, here's a very important point. The simple regression model of this form will not isolate uh, the beta 2 effect here. It's not going to isolate the number of bathrooms because we're not including the floor space as a control. So um, in this case, the regression package, uh, it doesn't know what the influence of floor space is. It doesn't know what all the other variables do. And so it's going to assign everything to beta 2. So uh, if this was model 1 and this is model 2, let's say in model 1 um, we estimate um, beta 2 hat equals $2,824.61. So then we would say, okay, you add another bathroom to the house. That's the only thing you change. You can raise the selling price by uh, 28, 24, 61. If you ran the regression in this form, you'd probably get a very different answer. You might get something like this, 13,269.98. Okay, much bigger number. So why is it a much bigger number? Because now... The regression equation is looking at the houses with more bathrooms and noticing that the selling price is higher and it's attributing the entire increase in the selling price to the only variable that it's got to work with. So um, this is going to be a biased estimate because there will be a lot of houses in the sample where the reason that they have more bathrooms is they have more floor space. So part of what people are paying for is the extra floor space. They're not necessarily pay just paying for the number of bathrooms. So this 
uh, number here, this is attributing all the variation in the price just to the number of bathrooms, even though some of that variation is attributable to the fact that houses with more bathrooms have more floor space. They also have more bedrooms. They might have more stories, bigger houses in general. So uh, this would be an inaccurate answer. This would be a biased estimate of what we're after, which is the effect on the selling price just of adding a bathroom to the design of the house. And so in general, with multivariate regression, um, if you want to get at that well-identified partial effect of the, uh, the variable we're interested in, then it's not just a matter of having that variable in the model, but you got to have all the other variables that matter as well. Okay, and um, so this is an issue um, in modeling called omitted variables bias. Um, if the true model is, let's say, y equals alpha plus beta 1, we'll put the i subscripts on here, 1i plus beta 2x 2i plus beta 3x 3i plus epsilon. Let's say that's the true model. So there are three things here that explain the variation in our dependent variable. Um, and if we estimate yi equals alpha plus beta 1 x 1 i plus epsilon. In this case, we are going to get a biased estimate. Okay. Estimate of beta 1. So the our estimator, beta 1 hat, will be biased, um, except in one particular case. There is, um, there's one case. Um, unless x1 is uncorrelated with x2 and x3. Okay, so if, if x1, x2, and x3 are all completely uncorrelated with each other, then and only then is it okay to leave the others out. But in our example, we're thinking about something like the number of bathrooms, which is correlated with the size of the house and the number of bedrooms. So um, if you only include the number of bathrooms, then the problem is that variable is not just measuring the number of bathrooms, but it's also act acting as a proxy for the other variables. And it's picking up part of the effects that should be attributable to them. So um, therefore, try to use all the variables that matter. So, uh, as I said, and just recapping, omitted variables bias arises if you've got um, explanatory variables that are correlated with each other, so they're kind of overlapping in what they explain in the dependent variable, and you leave one or more of them out, then the regression model is going to attribute some of the missing information to uh, the variables that you have included, and that will give us biased estimates. And in assignment two, you'll see an example of that. You'll see an example of how it is that these coefficients can change quite a bit when you include other uh, explanatory variables. But now here's the, the other side of the coin. Okay, um, Based on fear of omitted variables bias, you might decide, well, I'm just going to include everything. I'll throw every single variable I can think of into the model. However, then we run into the opposite kind of problem. And the opposite problem is that the regression model, the regression model has trouble when variables are highly correlated with each other. Uh, 
Um, so when they're highly correlated with each other, when you have two variables that are very closely correlated with each other, then the problem is they're not really contributing independent information to the model. So uh, let's take an example of car loans. All right, so let's say that um, you're working for a financing company and you're trying to develop a statistical model that lets you predict uh, how many car loans uh, you're going to be giving out each summer. Um, and so we'll call Y the, the number of car loans and uh, we'll just look at two particular variables that might be in your model. So it's alpha plus beta 1 and I'll call it um, L sub i plus beta 2 p sub i plus epsilon i and l i is the consumer lending rate. Okay, so from the um, banking system, the prevailing consumer lending rate. How much does it cost people to, to borrow? PI, we'll call that the prime lending rate. Um, so in this case, uh, prime lending rate, that's the, uh, the rate that the Bank of Canada charges to its banks when they borrow money. So the consumer lending rate and the prime lending rate, the thing about them is they move together. They're very highly correlated. Consumer lending rate's a bit higher than the prime lending rate, but a graph of the two of them, there would just be two lines that sort of move together. So really, if you know one of them, you pretty much know what the other one is. Um, so let's say that the correlation of these is 0.99, something like that. Now look at... Uh, the regression model here and remember what the uh, the formulas do is it tries to tell us what's the unique contribution of this variable uh, holding this variable constant or controlling for this vari variable um, and similarly what's uh, the unique contribution of this variable the prime lending rate holding the consumer lending rate constant well we won't look at the formulas here. Well, later on, we'll look at the formulas, and you'll see specifically in a mathematical way why why it breaks down in the case like this. But conceptually, what we're doing is we're asking the regression model to come up with two coefficients to describe what's really the same thing. Okay, it's really just interest rates. It's the the movement of interest rates, and we're saying, give me two coefficients to describe the same thing, and um, so it can't do that. So this phenomenon has a name. Um, it is multicollinearity. All right. Um, and um, multicollinearity uh, can be detected in a regression model. Um, okay, suppose your T statistics are very small. Now you'll remember that if you have a very small T statistic, that means you can't tell if the coefficient is any different from zero. So your coefficient is not significant. But R squared is large, and your F, maybe your F statistic is large. So in this case, if you just had these two variables, you might get a large F statistic and a large R squared but your t-statistics are really small. So that would indicate uh, you've got a multicollinearity problem. The r-squared is high, the f-statistic is large, because the two taken together jointly have explanatory power. It's just the computer can't tell you which of the two of them is actually doing the explaining. It's just saying the two taken together. So in that case, what's, what's the strategy or the solution? Uh, only include one of them. Um, if you can get away with that. All right, so in this case, this would be fine. Um, 
you don't need to have the two different interest rates in a model like this. There are going to be other variables you'd want to include, you know, obviously car prices, average incomes, population, all that stuff. But um, as far as the interest rate goes, you only really need the lending rate. You don't need to know. If you know that, you don't need the prime rate. Or you could have the prime rate without the lending rate. One way or the other. Just You only need one of those in the model. Um, in our housing model, Uh, remember we had the number of bedrooms and the number of bathrooms. Now it's possible in a sample of real estate data it might be that these two are really correlated. So um, there's very little variation in the number of bathrooms except um, when it's correlated with the number of bedrooms. That might be the case. might not be the case. You can have four bedroom houses where there's only one bathroom um, or maybe two bathrooms. Um, and um, uh, so it's not necessarily the case that these are perfectly correlated, but they might be fairly correlated. And so what happens if you detect you've got multicollinearity here? You've got um, high R squared, high F statistic, but these two uh, variables, the t-statistics, are insignificant. Well, if you drop one of them, and then the other one, its t-statistic becomes significant, then, okay, those two are probably collinear with each other. There's a multicollinearity there. They're, they're too correlated. However, um, you might just have to live with it. Okay, so um, in this case, you might just live with the problem. So here's the thing. Uh, multicollinearity doesn't bias the coefficient value. So your um, your betas, you can still use them. You can still interpret them the way you always would. What you can't do, though, is rely on the t-statistics. So the t-statistics are the ones that get, uh, get thrown out of whack. So if you decide, well, I don't really need the t-statistic, I just need the beta coefficients, then you might just live the problem, or better yet, get more data. Sometimes the problem will go away if you get a bigger sample size. But um, if you're in a situation where you don't need both variables, and it doesn't really matter which one you drop, then uh, you're better off dropping one of them, and then that allows you to construct valid t-statistics and do valid inference about statistical significance. Um, so this is, these are some of the um, introductory concepts around statistical modeling and model building. And we're going to learn a lot more about it, but I just want to um, recap a few concepts. Um, so no matter what kind of regression you do, simple or multivariate regression, you're going to get um, coefficients. That's a C there. Coefficients, standard errors. You're going to get uh, T statistics. And uh, we just talked very briefly last week about what you do with T statistics. We've got lots more to say on that subject, but... Um, uh, for the most part, though, um, the rule of thumb actually uh, it will take you a long way. The rule of thumb meaning if the t-statistic is greater than 2, then the coefficient is significant at 5%. We will refine that. Okay, then we need to um, sharpen that up a little bit, but um, uh, that's the main thing. The F statistic, um, the F statistic, we don't have a similar rule of thumb because the F statistic, uh, the cutoff for when it's significant can, can change quite a bit depending on how large the sample is. So the F statistic and the R squared, um, uh, we get those uh, with our regressions. So this is information about how the whole model works, um, how, how much explanatory power the whole model has. This is giving us inf information about the explanatory power of the specific 
variables. Um, okay, these are the big concepts that we're going to focus on. Then the other thing is, I've commented a few times about functional form. Okay, so we typically, we're dealing with linear regression. So, um, it's expressions like this. So we're just writing out linear functions. Um, everything is just additive. Everything's straight lines, nothing fancy. We will start to think about more complicated equations here, more complicated regression models. It's still always going to be um, linear in the end, but there are things that we can do that um, adds to this um, so that it allows us to pull more information out of the data set. And that's really uh, key in the end. We've got a data set. We want to pull as much information as possible out from it. Um, all these partial marginal effects and then um, more information besides. So um, what we're going to do next class is we're going to talk about uh, dummy variables because dummy variables are, um, we can include them. Uh, these are quantitative variables in our house price example, but they could be qualitative variables. They could be dummy variables. So we have to see how to include dummy variables in the model and then that opens up all kinds of additional possibilities for statistical modeling. And that is what we'll do next time.